Hello one, hello all, and welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show. This is episode number 117 with me, your host, Agostino. How you doing? How you feeling? What's going on? Hope you guys are feeling good. Had a great weekend, well hydrated, well rested, and all that malarkey, right? Yeah, feeling good, feeling good? All right, cool, safe. In case you're wondering, I'm feeling fucking stupendous, right? I've had a pretty brilliant weekend, all things considered. Another weekend in the Sober October um, challenge marked off. Tick, right? Um, as always, you know, doing these kind of challenges and heading up into the weekend. It's always a bit of a struggle. It's always a bit of a uh, 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 temptation. Always lurks around the corner. You know, you're like, oh, I should just have a whiskey. I should just have a drink. You know, I should go out and get some recreational party. Um um goodies you know and when i mean goodies i'm talking about toffees i mean toffees you mean substance i mean substances you know what i mean right but you hold on you hold on strong you hold on dear for dear life and you uh tell yourself that in the end um you're only going to see benefits from abstaining from these things for a short period of time and again it's i think it's it's hard to tell your brain that isn't it? your brain doesn't really understand that which is why people have to do cheat meals i'm assuming right we we're very um we're, we're not, we're not, I don't think, maybe we are why, I don't know. It's, we find it really hard uh, to delay gratification, right? We find it hard not just to have the donut right now, right? We find it hard to say, no, let me do my work first, then I'll have the donut. It's really difficult to do, but I think, um, I remember reading in this uh, book, it might be The Talent Code or another book where they mentioned something about an experiment they did where they could um, predict the likelihood that someone will be a success based on experiments they do on kids, where they tell them if they i think if they eat one biscuit or something i think yeah i think they if they have five biscuits on the table and they eat one no if they have five biscuits on the table and they don't take one or something on the lines then they get one extra for every one they don't take they get an extra one given to them so by the end of the of the experiment you end up with more biscuits if you, if you, if you don't eat them but then if you do eat them then you're free to eat them whatever and, and they did predict that something along the lines of whoever didn't eat the biscuits was or whoever didn't eat the sweets or the treats whatever they were given was more likely to succeed later in life right delayed gratification is one of those things that is um is the kind of bedrock of succeeding in life in some way shape or form right because that means taking on a sense of responsibility right it means uh answering to yourself you know because in this challenge you're only answering to yourself no one knows if you didn't go out and get smashed no one knows if you didn't whatever i mean it's a thing that's only it's private to yourself it's like people people stop smoking there's no need. There's no point of lying of how long you've not been smoking because it's only you've only got yourself to lie. You're only lying to yourself anyway. No one is like checking how many cigarette packs you've bought over the week or whatever, or how many stuff you're, you've been smoking in secret in the park and then spraying yourself with anti I don't know anti deodorant or whatever it may be. Um, so it's been an interesting challenge. Like I said, overall, it's of of course it keeps every week it's interesting when you go out and DJ. Um, I think that's changed my perspective on drinking overall. I think, you know, for all the people out there who are admonish or who look down on people who take drugs, like alcohol is probably, you know, a worse substance. It's not about what, it's not a what, what about ism, right? I'm not pointing the finger back at people that drink, but if you want to, considering how hard it is to get hold of class A drugs, considering how hard it is to get, of, get hold of good stuff, considering how expensive it is, and considering how inexpensive it is to drink alcohol, even, you know, if you want to get drunk, you can buy a shitty brand whiskey um, for under £10. You can buy beer for under a quid if, if you don't care about what it tastes like, right? You can buy wine in a box for £5, right? There's so much um, options in alcohol that you can get if you, you know what I mean? If you just look above the, uh, over the age of 18, most shops will serve you. But for the most part, drugs are, are still um, relegated or still um, kind of only used by like a small fringe of society for the most part. Obviously, in private, more people use drugs, I'm sure, because you know, it's a billion dollar industry. But for the most part, um, wide scale use of it is limited to like a, you know, a fringe set of society. But for the most part, everyone drinks, right? Same way where, same how, I guess it's the same kind of idea people have or the same objection they have towards sugar, right? Sugar is available everywhere, and people have access to it in things that they don't even know contain sugar. But drinking, man, the things you see when you're sober when people drink again, because I think when you're sober, you don't necessarily go out as much, do you? Because I've been I've been effectively going out um, every weekend because I'm DJing on Friday, so I get to see people that are drunk. But when you're sober, you don't necessarily put yourself in that kind of position. You're not gonna go out 
um, and subject yourself to drunk and sloppy people just, just, just so you can watch them like you're watching zoo animals. But I've had the pleasure of doing that, you know, standing in a DJ booth and kind of seeing people, you know, um, through the varying states of intoxication throughout the night is always a, an interesting spectacle, to say the least. But yeah, it's, it's been good for me personally. I think the DJing wise has always been, I've seen a different side of me. I've seen a different sense of clarity. Um, in the beginning, when I wasn't drinking and I was DJing, I'd get really nervous when I saw people leave and I start switching my music, right? I start like just trying to appease the crowd and not make them stay. But now I realize I get more, re I'm more relaxed now. So I don't really care if people leave or if no one's there, I'll just play what I want to play and then gradually get to where I want to get to, which, which effectively lends to a better overall set. And then when people do finally find their way to coming back in again, they they kind of get the feeling that I haven't been jumping around from genres to genres. I've been slowly progressing my way through different genres and then came back around again. So overall, I think it's worked pretty well. I think everyone's kind of liked what I've been playing. And um, for the most part, I've not been getting people telling me to sod off or throwing tomatoes and shit or salads at me. Do you know what I mean? That's not that's always a bad sign. Do you know if you're DJ and you get getting thrown fruits and vegetables. I don't even know where they're buying these fruits and vegetables when they're in Westfield, right? Maybe they're, they're going to John Lewis and buying a bag of lettuce for four pounds and then coming back down and throwing it at me? Probably not, right? So I'm lucky there's no Morrison's or Lidl or Sainsbury's around where they can buy really cheap um, vegetables and throw them at my uh, head, which wouldn't be, you know, nice, but I guess it would be some level, uh, you know, because at some point you want to be polarizing or you want to be, you know, you want to be amazing. You don't want to be in the middle, right? You don't want people to like just not bother that you're even there. So maybe throwing vegetables at me will be a sign that I'm doing something right, right? Like I'm, I'm that shit. <laughs> that they want to get me off the stage but so far so good that hasn't happened and it's been an interesting experience but i think this weekend might be the time might be the point that i break um i was in i was intending to do my sober october until the 2nd of november because i started i started a day late i started on the first no no it's on the first of november that's on the second of october what anyway I think I started sec or first of October. I think so. So I was intending to do it on second, right, to kind of like you know drag it a bit, uh, drag it into the weekend. But Baba Stilts is playing at Fold this weekend alongside some other people that he's invited, friends and family. And I kind of want to go down and have a bit of a boogie after I finish my set on Friday. So I think I might go. I think I might go and I think I might break then. I think my, my Sober October journey might come to an end, which might not be that bad. You know, I've done four weeks of Sober October. Um, I've done it previously before in the whole month of January when I was in Berlin during Fashion Week, during Trade Show Week. I did Sober October, I did Sober January um, easy, right? It was I didn't find that hard at all. So it wouldn't be a defeat in my eyes. It would be nice to kind of go until the end and celebrate with the whole Joe Rogan podcast guys when they're doing their live stream podcast on the Wednesday, I think, is the second, right? I think they're going to do like a, a kind of like a celebration and get fucked up and shit or a catch up, but... Yeah, so this party I've got, I'm going to put up on screen. This party's happening at, at Fold. It's, uh, I think tickets are still available, reservoirs, which is interesting, isn't it? Tickets are still available now, but only £10. So, uh, Baba Stutz is playing um, alongside uh, Eclair Fifi, Samuel DJ and Felix Hall. It's going to be at Fold, um, one of the newer nightclubs that we have now in London, um, mostly in Canning Town, or based in Canning Town. It's purported to be like a 24-hour club, but I think... If you look at the listings, I think what's happened is effectively they've got a license for a 24-hour party, but not everyone gets that. So I think well, some parties are 24 hours, some parties go until 6, which is quite good because there's not that many clubs in London that are open until 6 a.m. anyway. So 6 a.m. is still a bit of a win because most places shut at 3 or shut at 4. So 6 is a really, really good win in that respect. And you get a chance to jump on the Jubilee line to go home. So that's always a benefit. So yeah, Bubba Stilts is playing... Um, for a night called Visit, Visit Party Number 1, October 26th this weekend. So that's where I might break in terms of my Sober October challenge. A bit of a shame, really, but, you know, I think it might be a good time to kind of hang up the coat and go from there. But I think on a Friday, I might still go sober, and then as soon as it hits midnight and I hit fold, I might then go and take off my Sober October time, which, not, which won't be too bad, you know. That's what, how many days does that leave if I do it on, I do it on 12? That means one, two, three, four, five, five days short. I'm not too bad, right? I'm, I'm not going to go out anywhere on Halloween day anyway, on a Wednesday. I don't want to get dressed up and have face paint on. Um, so that would be quite cool. And Halloween as well, like, I don't know, man. It's a good holiday. Don't give us a good celebration. It's a good time to party, but it's a little bit OTT, isn't it? Like, I think Halloween is a lot like New Year's Eve. 
um, is a lot of that bank holiday weekend, right? For someone like me that tends to go out quite often or who likes to um, peruse around um, nightlife establishments, Halloween's probably the worst time to go out because all the normies, um, which is not to, not to be rude, but all the people that don't necessarily go out tend to go out on those days. They're encouraged to go out, right? Because it's the one day where everyone kind of can, where there's loads of options, where you're kind of maybe bored at home, um, you know, there's just free time. And why not? Why not partake in some adult dress up for once, right? But for someone that likes to go out quite frequently, seeing everyone in the world out, plus all your friends that go out, plus everyone that goes out in a scene, it's just too many people, man. And Halloween's a worse occasion. You know, everyone, all the girls dress up in their slutty, whatever, outfits. The boys trying to be kooky and dressed up as a fridge or as a bear, all that nonsense. Like, I'm just not down for it. It's not for me. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I just don't want to... I already make a bit of an effort getting dressed up, right? I, I, I try and look a bit dandyish. I try and look a bit suave. I try and, you know, add some panache to my outfits in general. So the last thing I want to do is then add face paint and glitter and fucking, I don't know, whatever spikes and horns and shit. It's just not fun. Um, I did it last time I did it, actually, which was a great time. Don't get me wrong. I went to this warehouse party in 2014, a mate of a mate who's in this band called Suppress. I don't know if they're still um, active now at the moment, but it's a couple of guys that used to work at the other, but I had a band called Suppress and they had, um, one of the guys used to live in this amazing converted primary school, or not converted, but you know, a reappropriated primary school somewhere near Tottenham, I'm going to say. So do you remember how primary schools were? Like all one level, like kind of like an allotment, right? All one floor, um, kind of like a bungalow, so an allotment, kind of like a bungalow. So all one floor, um, really, really shiny corrugated, really shiny, um, not corrugated, but you know those kind of wood floorings that got, they kind of like done in triangle shapes, like, but really, really shiny. So, you know, when you're back in primary school and it's slippery and you could like go in your socks and slide across the floor, that kind of style, right? And each basically classroom was someone's room. So imagine how big a, a primary school classroom was like, because they've got, you know, they've got the tables and chairs, they've got the little play area, they've got a bit where you put your coats up, they've got the board where the teacher sits, like, primary school rooms are massive, right? Especially those kind of primary schools, especially if it's one floor because they've got, you know, they've got so many um, square feet to cover or square feet to use. So they had, that's where they used to live and it was part of that global guardianship uh, program, which I'm sure it still goes on, which is a really, really, really cool um, program. Uh, effectively, what it was is that um, loads of buildings in London that were kind of in that limbo of being, of being kind of demolished and then, um, you know, so a new skyscraper was going to go up in the place of this primary school, right? But they're in that bit of limbo where they're signing papers, they're securing planning permission, they're getting the trades people locked in. You know, like th th there's a period, if you watch Grand Designs, you'd know that it takes really long from, it takes, it's a long process from buying a house to renovating it, to, even if you're going to tear it down, it's even longer, building regulations, all that stuff. It takes a lot, it takes a while for you to get it finished. Product. That's why the houses take so long. Why people tend to, you know, stay um, true and try and get something that's already ready-made or it's kind of already in its path, but kind of like reconstructing a house, the outer exterior, so the, not the interior, but, you know, stripping it down. I don't know, whatever that may be, it takes a long time. So um, during the whole housing shortage era and just, I think it came as well just after the whole like, um, the student fees went up and there was a bit of uproar with young people not being able to get houses. Um, this kind of programs came up, right? I think it may, may have been a kind of offshoot. Do you remember when all the um, squatting was happening? When the whole Occupy movement was happening, a lot of, the, lot of squatters were um, occupying sky, a former, like, you know, bank building somewhere in central London and setting up shop there and setting their kind of like, you know, Occupy movement shops there. So this whole premise started maybe around that sort of era. That's when I kind of heard about it or it kind of came to my attention. And the whole idea of the Global Guardianship Program or the or Guardian Programs in general was that you effectively um, were like a living security guard. So, you know, in buildings in central London and shit, where they had those security guards that come in after everyone's finished their shifts, like they, they start from like seven or whatever, maybe until really early in the morning. And they basically are in, meant to make sure that no one... Um, no one that's uh, what you call it no uh passes by kind of stroll into the office and walk in because most of these offices are open right as long as you've got a key you can kind of go in and go into them but if you don't work there they're not going to let you in you have to show your id card so just a general security guard to make sure they just keep an eye on the whole building not the most effective thing right it's a building of 30 plus floors and there's one african guy surrounding it i know he's black and he might be a bit strong but he's not going to be able to survey like 35 floors but hey oh you gotta do what you gotta do so um 
the whole idea behind it is that you were like a living security guard. So you basically got to rent, quote unquote, uh, a floor, a section, a room of a building. It could be an old people's home, a former old people's home. It could be an, a former hospital. It could be a primary school in the shape of this Halloween party I went to. It could be a sky, an, an old, an old, um, an old office office floor. I saw one before it being offered, like you know, like an office floor that a former company were in. So that effectively what they did is that you could basically uh, go in there and pick your kind of section. You could kind of div divide it up into sections. Of course, nothing too crazy. You can kind of put blinds up and kind of build your own little unit there. But the whole, but the whole, um, the kind of uh, cons or pros of it is that you get cheap rent, right? And you can live in an amazing postcode somewhere in the middle of London for like, I don't know, 300 quid a month in London. It's like, you know, obscene, um, obscenely low. But then the cons of it was that it meant that you could only, um, I think the longest period of time you could stay in one place was four weeks, right? Um, no, sorry, the shortest period of time would be four weeks and it could be up to anything to a year in the same place. But you were always on notice. So there was always a chance that the building regulations, they could, the, the, the contractor could get approved to tear down the building and then you have to, have to move out the next day. So you have to kind of always be, you, you couldn't have too much shit, right? You have to kind of, or, kind of you know, live light. In those terms, which makes sense anyway. If you're living in a in a former warehouse or something, you know, you have to have that mindset that you know you're not gonna live there forever. It's kind of like a a, a quote unquote permanent slash temporary space. But I remember going to this Halloween party in a former primary school in North London with this uh, bandmate that used to put on. Oh, this guy that used, was in the band, and that was probably one of the best Halloween parties I've been to. I think the fact that it was in a former primary school, it was behind a school gate. You had to climb over. Everyone dressed up, had house face paint on. They had a great sound system, great DJs playing. Um, everyone bought drinks in abundance. Like that was the first one, the kind of house party. You know, sometimes you go to house parties or people that put on warehouse parties and they say BIOB and people don't really bring drinks for everyone. People just bring drinks for themselves, right? And I know it's a, it's a common theme in London probably. I think so more so than any other place uh, outside of uh, this metropolitan city. But, you know, like when I, did, when I go to a house party, don't get me wrong, I'll bring drinks myself, but I just, you know, I might bring four more. And just leave them on the table. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not, or two more, or two more bottles. It's not that big of a deal, right? Um, especially if you're going to buy a few bottles of them and there's going to be stuff around. You might end up taking someone's uh, spirits or liquor and stuff. You, people are going to be intermingling drinks around. It's not the best, do you know what I mean? You might get tuberculosis and stuff. But overall, it's a good option. It serves, it serves a glow, the overall party community. And this is one of the first ones where there were drinks in abundance. There was a fucking ice, right? which is one of the most rarest commodities you're gonna, ever going to find in a house party. But when it's there, you thank the high heavens that you have it. And in general, just a good vibe. It was amazing. Probably the best one I've ever had, I've been to. Um, and since then, I've not really made an effort to get dressed up to go anywhere. Um, I went to one by accident, you know, like when you're out and someone told you to go to someone's house and I went there, it was like a, you know, a Halloween themed 70s night, which was you know really weird or awkward to go into when you're dressed up in a denim, um, I think I had a denim outfit, I think I had double denim on for 70s night, it just didn't make any sense, but anyway, so in general, I tend not to like going out on Halloween, so um, this Baba Stilts thing on Friday might be a good idea to go to and fall just to hang out. And I'm hoping no one gets too dressed up for it. There'll be club kids there who'll just be hanging out, having a good time. But I don't think there's going to be full on like zombies and, you know, like uh, slutty nurses and shit and all that malarkey. I can, I can count that out. But it might be a good option also to go out and take pictures, you know, like go around Dawson with my film camera and take pictures of all the sloppy messes that are around and trying to you know, trying to make the night carry on. But I don't know how people are with phones or with cameras in general, film cameras, people taking pictures of them. I don't know. It might be a little bit weird, but you never know. It might be something I might do in the end. I might not do it. But yeah, I think overall, I might break my um, my alcoholic fast on Friday and partake in the old drinker Malinky um, for the next weekend coming up. But apart from that, it's been pretty good. Training again this w this evening. I didn't do training this morning. Um, I finished actually uh, Homo Deus this morning too, so I had to pick between one or two things. I couldn't do two at the same time, so I had to pick. So I picked finishing Homo Deus, and I'm going to run this evening, which I don't tend to do. I don't tend to get around to doing because when I get back from work, I'm always tired, but I'm, I'm pointing out that in the universe, I'm making a public declaration. When I come back home, I'm going to run. I'm going to do um, 8 to 10, 200 meter repeats around the corner from where I live. There's a little like mini track thing that I kind of use to 
run around in. So I'm going to try and do, I'm going to do that, not try, change my language. I'm going to do that tonight when I come back from work. But I did, I did manage to finish Homo Deus, this book by Yuval Noah Harari. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He's the author of the very influential and very popular Sapiens, which I'm sure a lot of people haven't read. I finished it. I read it via audiobook. I also, I've also read 21 Lessons uh, for the 21st Century on audiobook, but I've got this in paperback edition, which is an amazing, amazing book. I definitely recommend you check it out. And yeah, it's a great, um, there are a lot of, would, would he say he's a philosopher? Would he say he's a philosopher? I don't, I'm not sure if you would cast this over. Let me see. Does he describe himself as a philosopher? Maybe. Uh, Dr. Yuvan Harari has a PhD in history and his name is so hard to pronounce, isn't it, sometimes? It's just so many ha 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 ha. Dr. Yuval Noah Harari, that's it, has a PhD in history from the University of Oxford and now lectures at the Hebrew Institute of Jerusalem, specialising in world history. Sapiens, a brief history of humankind, published 2014, has become an international phenomenon and is published in nearly 40 languages worldwide. It was on the Sunday Times bestsellers list for six months in paperback and was the New York Times top um, top 10 bestseller. So yeah, he was, a, he was a historian in some respects, right? So this book is great in terms of like specking out human history striking out the history of tomorrow like w what we're going to be what are the issues that we're going to face tomorrow right and i think this is a good section that kind of points out uh, la, 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 to pay attention to the, what is it there's a bit here yeah so th these are kind of the questions that he needs he's, uh, he's, uh, he's asking in this book that we need to kind of mull over right um if we think in terms of months, we have we had probably better focus on immediate problems such as turmoil in the Middle East, the refugee crisis in Europe, and the slow in Chinese economy. If we think in terms of decades, then the global warming, the growing inequality, and the distribution of the job market loom large. Yet if we take a generally grand view on life, all other problems and developments are overshadowed by free intellecting processes. The science is converging. Uh, intelligence is decoupling and non-consciousness but highly intelligent algorithms may soon know us better than we know ourselves and the three questions that we need to answer for the for the sake of mankind are number one are organisms really just algorithms are organisms really just algorithms and if and is life really just data processing what's more valuable intelligence or consciousness and what will happen to society politics and daily life when non-conscious but highly intelligent algorithms know us better than we know ourselves which kind of you know lends itself a, a bit to this whole idea or this whole movement that started now with smartphones uh, where that you can kind of track the amount of times that you're using social media apps or you're spending quote unquote screen time right the app that's on um, that's available now on ios the feature where you can kind of track how much time you're spending on various apps and to kind of limit your overall um phone in hand usage right because when you're on trains or when you're around you see everyone kind of like you know always scrolling or checking the text messages going through their pictures looking at phone again just to kind of avoid um you know just to avoid any kind of awkward moments which is kind of you know uh which is kind of um against it kind of battles against the whole idea of about being conscious right is uh, the whole idea about being in what do you call it present in your kind of kind of environment looking out into the looking out of the window of a train and kind of marveling at what's around you or looking around the train itself and marveling that it's you know this this in this encased encased metal cylinder that's hurtling at breakneck speed for an underground tunnel is somehow getting you to work reliably every single day all these hundreds of thousand people with varying weights are being transported through this tunnel do you know what I mean like this taking you out of that so essentially what i'm seeing here is all these lessons that he's kind of these kind of points that he's making us kind of meditate on kind of lends itself a lot to what's happening globally right everyone's kind of you know getting a bit holistic you're seeing a lot of youtubers talking about their sunday routine self-care you're seeing a lot of awareness on mental health you're seeing the screen um time app you know kind of making dominance you're seeing people um you're seeing people forsake materialistic goods for experiences going to festivals people traveling they're traveling to the same five destinations but you know at least they're traveling they're getting out there they're experiencing the world they're trying to talk to people who have different opinions you're seeing a lot of that happening in the world and there are a lot of there's a movement to, there's moving away from algorithms but the algorithms are hard to kind of break away from right the algorithm the algorithms on instagram discovery page where if you if you if, if for a week you start liking loads of fitness stuff for it like you you check your discovery page and all of a sudden you're obsessed with fitness now right so there's that that's kind of like tracking what you like and giving you more of it so you can stay on the app 
for instance, like when I was when I was on Instagram for a while, I kept getting loads of emails from Instagram telling me, "Oh, the things you've missed out on, the things that you should be checking up on. Your friends have made an update. See who followed you. Like loads of things that kind of draw you back into the app. It's like, look, I don't care, man. I'm not gonna. I just, just don't care. Like I haven't opened my Instagram app since the whole for the entire weekend. I think I've, last time I used it might have been on Friday, on Friday night or Thursday night. And you know, there's a lot of that kind of like t- trying to take you away from being present it's weird we we i think as humans we're we're kind of realizing that we're spending probably too much time on the digital on the digital platforms we're not using them as tools we're letting them use us which is you know that's that that's the bane of it i'm not saying that you should put your phone in a safe or lock it away somewhere all that nonsense right don't take any drastic measures but just use them as a tool same way you know sweets and treats and alcoholic beverages should be used um in moderation right you shouldn't be uh, you know you shouldn't be gluttonous the same way you shouldn't be gluttonous on social media i don't believe in the whole idea that they have a social responsibility to ensure that your sanity is intact right you have you have responsibility it's your responsibility to take your life um to take heed or take control of your own life and not kind of heed it to this behemoth that is the social media platforms but we, I think as humans, we're recognizing it's a problem, but the apps themselves need us in order to kind of, you know, drive ad revenue, uh, to drive engagement. So there's a really strange friction happening. But overall, this book has been very illuminating. As you can tell, I've, it's, it's kind of allowed me to think about things differently, make different connections. I, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, it probably might be a, a beneficial to kind of read it on audio via audiobook. Oh, you can read it on Audible, actually. Um, visit my link below the, um, in the show description to check it out. You can sign up for a free trial. But um, I recommend maybe checking out an audio book. Some of these books, when they're a bit dense, it's a good idea maybe to kind of get it on audio book so you can kind of get uh, you kind of get more of a summary of what they're talking about. Sometimes reading the words on paper, when, you know, with the whole idea behind algorithms, consciousness, and beings, and all this humankind, you might get a bit lost. But when you hear it said out loud, it's not that it's not as dense as you think it might might be. But I recommend you check it out. Maybe read them in order because I didn't read them in order. I read. No, no, I did. Can I? Yeah, I did. No, I didn't. I I finished Sapiens first on audiobook, then I finished Twenty One Lessons, then I finished this. So I kind of went front end middle. But maybe read them in order if you want to kind of get a, a good grip of what he's uh, Yuval Noah Harari is talking about. And another real cheap method, I think, is a good tip as well if you want to get a, an idea on Yuval, Yuval Noah Harari's kind of um, thinking. If you're reading Sapiens, then check out some of these talks based on Sapiens. Or just t- Google, uh, YouTube in Yovano Harari and Sapiens and type in talk. And you'll see loads of events, mostly an hour in depth, where he kind of talks on a panel or talks with a moderator or a host about the book and takes questions at the end. Usually the questions on these events you can kind of skip. The people people tend, in those kind of, I've noticed, in those kind of intellectual debates or those kind of panel discussions or those events, people that ask questions at the end usually, for the most part, want to flex their intellectual muscles too and show that they get it, right? They're, they are also smart. So sometimes the questions can be a bit dumb, but you can sometimes find some gems in there that can kind of spawn off into some good discussions so it's up to you whether or not you want to watch them but i recommend you check it out um a great 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 book that i'm happy that i finished finally today and now i'm gonna go off and read um gulag archipelago uh by by alexander solzhenitsyn because i think the 50th anniversary book is coming out very very soon that jordan peterson read read the forward for so i want to kind of get a head start on reading this version i have now at the moment and i think that might be a good opportunity to pause and stop the podcast because i want to do a short one today because i've got to head off and do my business but yeah um this has been excellent english episode number 117 as always thanks for checking me out i'll be back again on wednesday for my regular schedule programming of an hour's depth of podcast <laughs> many topics to speak about loads of stuff about the virgil ablo and louis vuitton drop that's happening very soon pop-up shop in mayfair which i'm still not aware i'm still not figuring out why they're doing it in london but i guess because they've got um a presence in mayfair for some i don't know it's just those, i'm still trying to figure out where that connection comes in um but the activation for it's been pretty impressive right seeing the whole stuff that um i saw pictures of um they uh they they did a, a kind of like club night thing somewhere in west london i don't know where it was um and i think what's his name benji b was the musical curator 
and they got Moody Man there. They made some amazing T-shirts that look really cool with the sort of like world tour map. And everywhere that the activation of the party happens, there's like a little uh, diamond. I'm not sure if it's a real diamond or a little jewel that gets dropped on the location where they're going to be, which is fucking cool. Um, he does make good merch, doesn't he, Virgil, for events. I'd, I'd argue, which might be a really uh, controversial opinion, but I'd argue that his merch events, the stuff that he does like on a whim quickly, is a lot better than some of the stuff that he sits down and actually designs or takes time to figure out. In my, again, in my in my opinion, um, I, I wasn't really that fan of the recent runway collection with the athletes. I thought that was a good idea to kind of put them on the runway and kind of give them a platform. You know, having those bodies on the runway is always fucking impressive. I love just seeing real women on runways. It just looks really... I love the contrast of seeing models and seeing athletes on there. It just looks really cool um, <clears throat> aesthetically. But yeah, I don't know. I think he's kind of... The stuff that he does on a whim where he just gets an idea and just kind of like puts it together. I think that, that's why he, he shows his real design chops or his real kind of like, you know, um, his, I don't know, tendency to kind of really hit out of the park with just one-off ideas. And that looked really, really impressive. So I like the look of that. Tall merch. And there's going to be another few topics to talk about as well. A couple of interviews that I read in terms of Dixon. From Innovation, Innovation had a really good interview that I read that I want to talk about too. Um, an interview with Steffi, a DJ too that I like on Rebel Radio, that was awesome, that she spoke about the whole, the whole thing I had about, you know, when you go to places about really engrossing yourself in the surroundings and not just, you know, doing the whole typical touristy thing as you mentioned in Berlin where, you know, people are coming in there expecting to, you know, when you, you know relationships where people are trying to draw, trying to extract value and not give any value, right? So same with Berlin, they're trying to go there and expect or any city in the, in the world, you're trying to you're trying to expect things to happen, but you're not willing to give anything. You're not taking part. You're not you're not kind of um you're not getting yourself involved in the scene. That's what you need to be doing more often. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of um talk about that a bit. Uh, some music I've been listening to, like the Future and Juice World World on Drugs um out collaborative album, which is insanely good. Uh, the Little Yatty album too, Nothing to Prove, which is really, really impressive. Some amazing beat selection on there. He's probably one of the, if you're not a fan of his voice, which I'm sure some people aren't a fan of, you have to really um, admire his beat selection. He really knows how to pick the beats that kind of do his, his voice a lot of favors. So I recommend you checking that out too. And loads of other things are going to be on the horizon for the next episode. But again, thanks so much for tuning in for this one. This has been the Exo Zing Show episode number 117. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you want more information regarding moi, check out my website, link below, exozinger.com for all updates concerning your boy. See you again very soon. Thanks for checking me out. Peace out, homies. <laughs>